think our last series, the Fear Factor series, was a great series. Y'all agree? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. It's a good one for all of us, myself included, to go back and just look at it again from time to time as the fear starts to creep in. Go back. What does God's Word say about that? Those moments. Um, so we have that for you. If you, if you uh, have an opportunity, go ahead and look at that again. I think Steve did a great job last week. I really do. I think he's, he's out of the room, so I can embarrass him because I can't really embarrass him. He's gone. I'm sure he'd be blushing if he could hear me. Steve, can you hear me in the other room? Great job. Great job. We don't ever take a week off. I, I believe that was probably the strongest or one of the strongest uh, Memorial Day messages you'll ever hear, so we have that available to listen to as well. Our last series was great, but I think our new one has the potential to at least be as good. And we do once again have Steve uh, wrapping up the series. He will preach the last week of our new series, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, July 2nd. Um, but don't think that when Steve is preaching that you're getting out any earlier. Uh, I checked the tape, and he actually preached. He passed the 35-minute mark, so I have to say, well done, sir. Uh, you wouldn't even know I was in the other room, so that was, that was pretty good. I had so much fun in our Fear Factor series, but I'm, I'm actually I'm ready. I'm excited for something new. I'm really excited for something new. I want to preach a series that's focused on our minds. Focused on our minds. So I've titled, entitled the series, Mind Matters. Mind Matters. I think that's a pretty creative title, if I'd say so myself. Uh, first of all, I, I, I thought of it. So that's part of the reason why I think it's so good. Um, but really, uh, it's got a double meaning. It, 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 first of all, uh, Mind Matters means uh, the matters of our mind. But also, the things that we think about matter. Is anyone's mind blown yet? <laughs> it will be soon if it's not yet. So we have two verses, and they will be up on the screen in a minute. You don't have to flip there. I'm going to be preaching from Romans 12. If you want to open your Bibles, you can. Your translation might be a little bit different than what I'll be preaching from in the NIV. I wanted to choose the NIV on purpose this morning uh, because there's a phrase that really stood out to me in the NIV version. Two verses. I want us to fix our minds on those, and we'll kind of work through them. But you don't have to worry because we're going to be camped out. Camp out series. Shout out to Kingdom Rock kids. Jokes might not get any better this morning, uh, but we'll be camped out in Romans 12, 1 through 2. So it says this. Uh, this is Paul writing. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So much just there. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and His pleasing and His perfect will. Great, great uh, verses there. The first word that you see is crucial. It is so crucial, and yet so often we want to just get right past it and get into that part about uh, our bodies as a living sacrifice and not conforming to the patterns of this world and, uh, and, and what about what it says about our minds being uh, be transformed by the renewing of our minds. But there's something so powerful in that first word, therefore. What does Paul mean, therefore? What is it, therefore? For. Why did he write that word? Why does chapter 12 start off with therefore? It's so strange that it would be this way. Imagine that I preached a sermon and I started my sermon off like this. Uh, therefore, in light of all the big changes that I talked about last week that will greatly affect your lives, Offer your bodies as a living. You'd be like, what? What? If you weren't here last week, you'd be going, wait, 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 wait. Big changes, going to affect my life. What are you talking about? What is the therefore, therefore? I don't get it. See, all you'd be thinking about, you'd be tuning me out, is you want to know 
What came before? Why is the therefore? What are you talking about? Same thing about Paul, but you can't, you can't blame Paul. You see, when Paul wrote this letter to the Romans, it was one big letter. There was no chapters. There was no verses. So if you're going to blame anyone, blame the scholars that start a chapter off that's a connecting word to everything else that came before. Um, so I want to dive into what is all that stuff that came before we get to this part where he says, therefore. You all tracking? You all following along so far? Good. Good. Therefore is so big, it doesn't just connect us with chapter 11. It actually connects us to chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way through. All those chapters are connected with this one word before Paul starts something new. And so it's amazing because chapter 12 is a completely different shift for Paul. He goes from doctrine to practice. He goes from theology to ethics in how we live. He moves from foundation to application. And so everything that came before is the reason that we are now able to live in such a way. And so you can't just drop into chapter 12 and go, okay, I got it. I'm going to offer my body as a living sacrifice. I got it. I got it, Paul. You have to read what's going on before this. Y'all ready for me to preach 11, 12 chapters of Romans? Y'all ready for that? We'll get to the late by 8. I don't mind. Thanks be to God that Paul summarizes the 11 chapters in two words. Aren't you happy about that? So we don't have to go back all the way through. I'm going to just drop two words on you in a minute. But what he's saying is Christian living must grow out of something. And that something uh, is pretty remarkable because it's, it's, not, it's not us like trying harder and, and got to do better and that. There's something else that enables us and allows us to live in such a way. And we can't take this for granted. We can't go past the therefore. we got to stop there. Because, for instance, um, if you have a friend who is a Hindu and, and, and practices Hinduism, in that religion, it's very interesting, you can have whatever belief system that you like, anything, as long as you live out this thing known as dharma. Has anyone ever heard of that word? Y'all look maybe a little rusty on your world religions 101. You want me to explain what dharma is to you? Dharma, I think it was a show, wasn't there a dharma and gray back in the day? Dating myself. Uh, dharma means morality, living with a certain character. It's all about ethics. So in Hinduism, they don't care at all what you think or what you believe. Theology, throw it out the window. All we care about is what you do, how you live. If you live with Dharma, you live with good character, you don't harm your neighbor, uh, you, you pet your dog, you do all that stuff, you're good. You're good to go. You're all right with, with them. And so on the surface, that can be pretty enticing because it's like, hey man, doesn't matter what you believe, it's just how you live. But what Paul says is remarkable. He views the world completely different. His worldview doesn't jive with Hinduism. He says ethics, how we live, is based on what we believe. Our theology. You can't separate the two. They are related to each other. And so you have these 11 chapters that set the foundation for what we believe that will carry into how we live. You cannot separate them from themselves. So if you've got your sermon notes, all of that being said, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace that we have received, Romans 1 through 11, those, those 11 chapters, lead us to favorite word, therefore, of Romans 12. You'll never look at therefore the same way again. You'll be reading your Bibles. You'll be like, there's a therefore, and you get excited, and I love it. I love it, because that's wonderful, because you've got to ask, what is it there for? When you get to 12.1, we're able to live in such a way because the foundation was set. In other words, ethics, how we live, flows out of our theology of who we are in Christ. If we don't know that, it's going to mess everything up. 
And this is so key because in circles, in Christian circles around the world, you have many people that are trying to earn the favor of God, that are trying to perform uh, to be accepted by their Heavenly Father. They don't realize that God already accepts them in Christ. They've already been made perfect, found blameless because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And it changes the way that we see God and what we do. It actually enables us to actually even do way more, bear forth fruit in our lives because we're att attached to the vine. So what are those two words? Going back to those two words. Summarize Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way through to 11 in two words. Paul does that. He says... God's mercy. He says, all of this stuff that I have laid out for you all points to God's mercy. The word mercy is this great word, great word in the Greek. Oiktermas. Oiktermas. It means compassion, but it actually goes above compassion. It literally means, in this instance, the heart of compassion of God. So in view of, this is why I wanted the New, New International Version, it says, in view of having our minds set on the very heart of compassion of God towards you, offer your bodies as a living and a holy sacrifice to God. So, just a snapshot of some of that mercy. I don't have time to go through it, but I just want to share five verses. Just a snapshot of some of the mercy that Paul talks about. Some of the compassion of God towards you that sets the foundation for chapter 12. In, in chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he writes. It's the power of God that brings salvation to everybody who believes. And then he says in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, all are justified freely by his grace through the uh, redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Another snapshot of the compassion of God. Romans 5, 8 goes even further. It says, but God demonstrated his love towards us. That while we were still sinners, man, God would have compassion on us. Christ would die for us while we were far from God. And then Romans 10, 9, and if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And then lastly, our last chapter, Romans 11, he goes 11 to, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Just because things are happening, don't think that God has uh, rejected you. He's working on your behalf. In fact, the greatest display of compassion happened that he would send his only son to die in your place. And so it's, it's remarkable. So Paul says, therefore, therefore, because of everything that I just shared with you, and there's way more, my brothers and sisters, he's writing to the church, in view of God's mercy towards you, with the thought of God's unbelievable compassion toward you, offer your bodies it's a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It's your true and proper worship. Now, I really do love the NIV version because it says, in view of, in view of. I want to stop there for a moment, in view of. I was thinking about my life for a little bit, and, and I thought, for me, when I want to view something the most, when I want to view it the most, where do I have to put it? Something I want to see most often. For me, it would be the fridge. I'm just telling you the truth. Like, I'm guaranteed if I put something on the fridge, I'm going to see it at least 10 times in a day. I might not look like I put it on, but I put it on. I, I can pack it down. I can eat when I want to eat. And so my kids made something in art class, my daughter Ava, that I think is a good example. I don't have it on her fridge because it's a book. I mean, she made a book. This is impressive. Mm -hmm. There's something I want to show you. And if it wasn't in the book, it'd be on the fridge. Because I don't want to ruin the book. But she wrote this. This was way back in March. It's the March's journal. So here it is. It says, I love you, Dad. 
And it's a picture, uh, it's a picture, I don't know if you can see, but she's sitting on my lap and she's actually driving our car. I don't know if it freaked the teacher out at all or not. It was just down our road. But I think I had to ask her to translate because she wrote in Hebrew. I didn't know she could write Hebrew. <laughs> I drove my dad's car today, it says. And what I love about this, besides it's really awesome, and she says, I love you, Dad, is on the next page, it says, I love you, Mom. I don't know if you can see that. It says, I love you, Mom. But the only page that got a star sticker <laughs> is the I love you, Dad. So I like her teacher a lot. I really like her teacher. But man, that's, I can be having like the worst day in the world. But if I got that up on my fridge, or I got that, say I got that with me today, man, I'm feeling pretty good. Amen. So Paul is saying, we got to keep it in our view. God's compassionate love towards us. you got to keep that front and center. Build your lifestyle off of the fact that he compassionately loves you. Live in such a way with that thought that glorifies God for His great mercy in Christ. And I love this because this doesn't just benefit me. This actually benefits those who are around me. Because the amazing thing is, if I can have this, this view of God loving me while I was far from Him, while I was yet still a sinner and sending his son to die, and he loves me, and I, I'm found blameless in his eyes, then the way that I encounter other people and interact with those that are difficult to love, those that rub me the wrong way, I'm enabled to love them in such a way where I demonstrate compassion because he first loved me, and his love is working its way through me, and it's impacting those around me. It's offering my body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now, there's a lot in there. I don't have a whole lot of time, but I just wanted to break it down a little bit. Sacrifices in the Old Testament were made mainly for the atonement of sins. There was other ones that were made as well, but mostly atoning for your sins. Uh, where a bowl would be sacrificed and the blood of the bowl would stand in place of your own blood so you wouldn't die. They would sacrifice a bowl for your sins. But everybody knew that the blood of bulls and goats would not take away our sins because, and I preached on this a few weeks ago, it was impossible. By the time you got to the synagogue parking lot, you already blew it. I mean, you'd have to constantly going back in, and they'd have to kill another one, and another one, and another. It just didn't do. But it was pointing to a time when Christ would come, who is our lamb, who is our sacrifice, and all atoning is finished. Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. And so valuing God is what worship is. It's what true and proper worship is. So it works its way out like this, in, in a nutshell. God displayed His mercy by sending His Son and vindicating His own, saving sinners. We are then lavished in mercy because of Christ. We see that and we embrace it, that's faith. And we treasure it, that's worship. And we live it out with our bodies so that people will see who is valuable to us. He's constantly shown to be the supremely valuable one. And other people are drawn to Christ through us. And everything in verse 1 is about the value and the worth of God. I told you there's just so much packed into verse 1. There's just so much there. But verse 2, it says this. Now this is the mind matters part. Do not be conformed to this world. You know why it says that after all of that? Because the world does not value God. It does not worship God for who He is and what He has done. But they see that and demonstration through our lives. They see Christ in us and how lovely and how beautiful and wonderful that is. 
So do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The matters of your mind matter. Right believing will produce right living. <clears throat> We see this in the wisdom of Solomon. He wrote in Proverbs 23, 7, and it's, it's wonderful. It's just so wonderful. He says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's why I preach so strongly that right believing produces right living. And that's why it's so key for the foundation of the 11 chapters that come before. The all opposite is also true. If you believe wrongly in your mind, it will produce wrong living. For instance, if we attach a label that's incorrect, that I'm nothing but a dirty sinner, and we believe that label, then what do sinners do? They sin. And so, of course, if you believe you're nothing but a sinner, you're just going to go on just sinning, because that's what sinners do. But the Apostle Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, so why would Paul tell Christians to be transformed by the renewing of their minds? And there's a hint, but it comes way earlier. So you have to read the first 11 chapters if you want all these awesome things, this wisdom that he's dropping to us. In Romans 5, 17... Paul tells us that God's intention for us is to reign in this life. That's pretty remarkable. It doesn't happen through conforming to the unbelieving world. Every believer knows what happened to Jesus on the cross. But unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of people and a lot of believers even who don't know exactly what happened to them at the cross as well. Our punishment was upon Him. We became the righteousness of Christ Jesus that means that we are holy and we are blameless and we are pure. And Hebrews talks about how He made us perfect. That we have right standing with God forever and it doesn't change based upon what we do. You see, if we know what happened at the cross, if we don't know what happened at the cross, we strive to become someone we already are. We're trying to become a better version, a, a saint. But Christ has already made us into saints and children of the living God. And we'll fight to obtain something that we already have, His favor, His love, His mercy, His grace. we got to keep it in our view. What God has done for us, not what we have to give to Him. See, Paul is saying, if you got this right, then you'll live right. Don't try to live right to please God and try to uh, impress God based upon what your performance record is, because it, none of our performance records are perfect that will impress God that way. It's what Christ has done in us receiving His Son. So... The instant you were born again, God did an amazing work in your life. He changed just about everything there is to change about you. But there is one thing that God did not change about you, which I find remarkable. Do you know what it is that God did not change about you when you became a new creation in Christ? What's the one thing that He didn't change about you? Pretty well. Well, free will, that's good. Yes, he has given us free will, yes. And that does play into the answer. Um, so that's a really uh, deep theological term that I don't want to dive into that well this morning. But free will, yes, that is, that is good. Um, the thing he left unchanged was your mind, your way of thinking. Only you can change that. Only you can change the way that you think. So... If there's one part of you that did not change at the cross, what do you think is the key to living the victorious life that God wants you to live in this life here on earth? Your mind. 
change the way you think and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, he would write in Ephesians 4, 23. He wants us in our mind to recognize how valuable we are to God. That he would redeem us because he loves us. And his compassion towards us, it knows no bounds. So change your mind. I, I, I titled this sermon, Change Your Mind for the Better. You know that our thought patterns, they've proven this. Our thought patterns are shaped by our past. It's also scriptural. 2 Peter 1.13 talks about this. Our thought patterns are shaped by our past. It's so easy to prove. I want to prove it to you, though, this morning. Okay. So what do you all think about that restaurant in Clarkston called The Woodshop? So, okay. Anybody drooling? Anybody drooling? See, you all who have been there, your mind goes back to your experience of when you were there, right? And whatever experience you had, if you had a horrible service and the food was lousy, you're like, oh, oh the wood shop. But if you liked it and enjoyed it, which is many, um, you're, you're like, man, the wood shop, man. I mean, now we're talking. We should go there afterwards. Um, but what about this? If I was to ask you, uh, what do you all think about the Galapagos Islands? <laughs> cool. You're like, I got nothing for you, Pastor, right? Your mind still went there, though, didn't it? You're like trying to like, okay, where is that located? What do I have on file for the Galapagos Islands? Uh, blank. It's like empty, right? We haven't been shaped by the Galapagos Islands. But the woodshop has, we've had an experience there. So our thought patterns are shaped by our past, but this, is, this goes even deeper. This is really remarkable here. Um, with our minds, everything we think of, we like to reference our past. But which past are you identifying with? Which past are you identifying with? Your old self-history before Christ? Or are you identifying with your new past history and current state and reality of being in Christ? Being a new creation? Which do you identify with? You see, 2 Peter 1.13 that I referenced, what Peter writes is he says, everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness, it comes to the knowledge of him who called us. If you want to see a breakthrough in your life, because we can get stuck in ruts, we can get stuck in destructive thought patterns, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, doggone it, people don't like me. The opposite of Stuart Smalley, remember? SNL, great. Look in the mirror. No. Um, if you get stuck in that rut, and it's hard to change the way you think, the breakthrough happens this way. The more you see your true identity in Christ, it goes back to the viewpoint. What do you got on your fridge? What are you thinking about? What are you reflecting on? The more you see your true identity in Christ, the more thoughts of peace and purpose will replace those defeatist, condemning thoughts. Because everybody has them. Let, let me tell you, there's people I've met that are all smiles and sunshine, and you think they wake up and like everything is perfect in their world all the time. I had a good friend that was like that. And I found out deep down when I got to know them even, even closer and deeper, and they shared something that was going on in their life, they were hurting. They were more depressed than anybody that I knew. But on the outside, they had a big smile. They had these thought patterns that were devastating them. That they weren't good enough. They weren't, they weren't going to make it. They didn't have a purpose. They didn't, you know, whatever it was. And they masked it with a smile. But, you know, the beautiful thing is when they got to be a part of the youth group and they started to uh, grow in their faith and learn about what Jesus Christ has done for them, they saw their true identity in Christ. And peace began to enter their world. And that smile didn't change, but there was something about it. It was like a sparkle. It was the fact that it was genuine and it was real. It was no longer hiding behind the smile. It was, man, God has been compassionate towards me. It changed their whole world. It was my sermon. I'm so excited. I don't even know where we're at. Don't be conformed.
transformed this world. Okay, I got another like last thought. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's in the present tense. It's ongoing. It's continual growth in unconforming to the world. Now that's good news because a lot of us, we could get really discouraged if we're like, man, I thought I had it. I thought I arrived at the point in my mind where I, I didn't have these negative thoughts. I thought I was there, but today is a Tuesday and I'm having some of those thoughts again. It's because you got to consistently, constantly renew your mind with what God's Word says about you. It's, it's an ongoing thing. We never, we never just arrived there. Not here on, on this earth. The Greek word is, I love this, sus hakmatiso. Sus hakmastio. Love it. It means don't be fashioned to one's pattern. This is really cool. Boy, was I ever reminded of this a few weeks ago. Of what that might look like. What does it look like to be fashioned to one's pattern? You see, I'm not a voice of fashion, so I might not even know what I'm talking about when it comes to this. But I saw this on Yahoo. This is Rihanna, and she went to something, and that's what she wore. And I'm looking at that, and I'm like, wow, that's out there. It's a little different, right? But that's okay. It's just, it's just out there. Um, but there was this little girl, and oh my gosh, was she adorable. This is what I saw of one fashioning themselves after someone's pattern. Look at this little girl. She saw the picture. She's like, I'm going to pull it off too. I love it. I love it. But I love Diane, but I thought about it this way. This is how I think about it. Imagine if she wore this. I don't want to embarrass her too much. This morning. I would be so distracted. I would be like, what? What is that? Like, why would you want to wear that? You've got so many good outfits, right? Like, that's like not really your style. It's kind of out there. What we have in Christ, our new selves, is infinitely better. Why would we try to copy the pattern of the world? I'm not saying, I'm not getting into fashion style. If you want to wear that, go ahead and wear that. Wear it with pride. I mean, do your thing. Be you. Be authentic. Whatever. Uh, but what I'm saying is like, if you've got it all in Christ Jesus, why would you try to clone something that is less than? It just it blows my mind. We've received the great compassion of our Heavenly Father. That's the image that Paul is painting in Romans 12 too. You've received it. Don't try to go back and live your lives in a way that was before Christ. That's just crazy. On the cross I die. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that is the glorious beginning of your new true story. Amen. Now, I'm so out of time, but I did have to point this out. Romans 12 ties into the first 11 chapters, which is true, but it also ties into Romans 15. In Romans 15, 8 through 9, Paul writes, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. And here it is. And in order that the Gentiles, that's everyone else who was not Jewish, might glorify God for what? Might glorify God for His mercy. That they might see a God who is compassionate towards them when they don't even know Him, would love them so much, and who would display His love through His Son and through His followers as they go into the world and then bring Christ, the light of the world, into these dark places. Because... The aim of all 16 chapters is that we might make the mercy of God on display, beautiful among the nations. If you look at verse 12 alone, it's all about God's compassion that we've received. We understand it. It's in our view. And then it works its way out through our lives. Because in verse 8 near the end, it says, the one who does acts of mercy 
So you're, you're going to do it. I know you're going to do it, Paul says. The one who does these acts of mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Because it would just be so weird if you're showing compassion and you got a grumpy look on your face. It would just freak people out. Like, ugh, let me help you across the street. I know you could use it right now. It just would be, would be weird. So he's like, do it with cheerfulness. Verse 9, let your love be genuine. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Verse 15, weep with those who weep. Verse 16, associate with the lowly. Verse 17, repay no evil for evil. Verse 19, never avenge yourselves. Verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. We are able to extend the mercy and compassion in chapter 12 because our lives are built on, rooted in, and founded on the very mercies of God. And so I would say, let's get the mercy of God in plain view. Let's put that verse those verses on our fridge, or if your fridge couldn't contain it all, which it can't, download our app. Download our app. It'll be in your plain view. And watch how it transforms and renews our mind to think right, to change our mind for the better, and then go forth and extend mercy and compassion towards other people.